Good afternoon. I'm spot on weather meteorologist Matthew Euler. And today we're going to do a training session on something you see every day in the sky, the clouds. And the clouds tell us a lot of what's going on in the atmosphere, whether that atmosphere is stable or unstable, uh, what kind of weather conditions we can expect from day to day, whether they're dry or wet. So let's go ahead and jump right into the training on clouds. This is one of my most favorite topics. All right, so first, before we actually get into the different cloud types, let's talk about how clouds form. There's three conditions that are necessary before clouds can form as a result of what's known as condensation. Now, in a previous training video, I covered the differences between, let's say, condensation, uh, evaporation, sublimation, all those different phase change types. Condensation, as a review, is basically the conversion from a water vapor into a liquid. So a gaseous state of water to a liquid state of water is what condensation is all about. So in order for clouds to form, we need to have rising air in the vertical. And that rising air in the vertical, as it rises, it cools and it condenses through that process of condensation forming these cloud droplets. So first and foremost, the big thing we need is the presence of sufficient moisture in the atmosphere. If the atmosphere is completely dry, let's say over a desert area, then we really don't have that moisture we need. You need the rising air and you need that rising air again to cool and condense out uh, once the temperature lowers to the dew point. So we need sufficient moisture. The second thing we need are what's known as hygroscopic nuclei in the atmosphere. Now hygroscopic, what that term means it is a term that describes something that's water absorbing or water loving. Um, some of the particles in the atmosphere, whether they be dust particles or ocean spray uh, or haze, uh, some kind of pollutant around urban areas, you know, from a factory, this, these are the particles at which water vapor is going to be attracted towards and we're going to form these cloud droplets based around these nuclei. And then lastly, again, as I already previously mentioned, we need a cooling process. Next, moisture is supplied to the atmosphere via evaporation. Now to again review that concept, evaporation, this occurs when you have a liquid stage going to a gaseous stage or a water vapor. Um, so there's a lot of moisture on the Earth's surface and rivers, lakes, the oceans, as well as through plants, believe it or not. When it rains, these plants absorb some of the water, but some of that water remains on the leaf stems. And what happens is the sun comes out and it tends to heat the surface and it removes that moisture from the ground, from the rivers, lakes, and oceans via evaporation. So moisture is supplied to the atmosphere via this process, evaporation, and then it's distributed both in the horizontal by the winds as well as in the vertical and also vertical air currents. For example, on a very hot summer day, you get these rising vertical air currents to develop. Again, hygroscopic nuclei. Just to break down what this is about. These are particles of any nature on which condensation of atmospheric moisture occurs. Hygroscopic literally means having an affinity for water. And you look at the diagram in the lower right portion of this slide, you'll notice these little blue dots, that represents the water molecules, and then those couple of brown dots you see represent the hygroscopic nuclei. Water is attracted to these. If we had a purely clean atmosphere, it would be very difficult for clouds to form to begin with because of the lack of these particulates in the atmosphere. The most effective hygroscopic nuclei, by the way, are products of combustion um, via sulfuric and nitric acids, as well as salt spray from the ocean. When the wind really gets blown over an ocean surface, uh, when the waves break, those waves are kicked up by the wind, those waves break, they tend to release a lot of salt particles into the lower lying atmosphere. The presence of hygroscopic nuclei is a must, as water vapor does not really condense without them. So. We gotta get that condensation going. We need those particles. The cooling process, how does this happen? 
Well, there's several processes in the atmosphere by which air is going to be cooled. Convective cooling via expansion. Uh, as the air rises, again, say we have a heated surface, that lighter, more buoyant air is going to rise in the vertical, and as it rises, it's going to expand and cool. Additionally, another cooling process is known as mechanical cooling via the expansion, and then we have what's known as radiational cooling, which generally occurs in a much more shallower, closer to ground area. And additionally, we have what's known as convective cooling. This is the ascent of a limited mass of air through the atmosphere because of surface heating. Now you get a lot of convective cooling happening, especially during the summertime, when the sun is much stronger, it's higher in the sky, the radiation is much more intense. So if a sample of air is heated, it is going to rise because it's going to be less dense than the surrounding air and it's going to decrease in temperature as, as it rises until the temperature and dew point are essentially the same, resulting in what's known as saturation in the atmosphere. The saturation point results in condensation. And you can see the saturation point by looking up at the sky and seeing the lowest layer of clouds. That's going to be where the base of those clouds are. That's going to be your saturation point. If you look at the lower right hand diagram, just showing you an example of when you have the arrows pointed upward from the ground from the warm surface, that is known as convective cooling. Um, you'll notice too that there's differences in the temperature between the surrounding air and that rising vertical air, those currents. Um, so you do have some sinking air being cooler and denser and then that rises up over the heated surface again. So it's one big circulation or redistribution of heat energy in the atmosphere. As far as mechanical mixing goes, when we think about mechanical mixing, uh, I want you to think of orographics. That would be mountainous lifting. As air blows up against one side of the mountain, it cannot physically go straight through the mountain. It's got to go up and over the mountain. And so usually on the windward side where that wind's blowing from, you'll get this mechanical mixing of air as it rises up that windward side of the mountain. Additionally, frontal processes, whenever we have a front moving into an area, um, you're generally going to get rising air motion and cooling and the formation of clouds. In addition, the orographic processes, just kind of mention this again, if air is moist and lifted over mountainous areas and hills, clouds may be formed. And that overall type of cloud will depend on what's known as the lapse rate. The uh, lapse rate refers to the rate of temperature decrease or a dropping with height. If a lapse rate is weak, or we have a slow rate in cooling with height, the clouds are generally more layer-like, more stratiform. But if the lapse rate is steep, which means we have a large change in temperature with height, a rapid cooling with height, then we generally get those puffy cumulus clouds to form. Additionally, frontal processes, you know, whether we're talking warmer, less dense air moving up and over, uh, heavier, denser air at the surface near the ground, uh, like a warm front as that warm, less dense air overrides the cooler surface air, or a cold front moving into an area lifting warm air in the vertical. The type of cloud formed due to frontal processes is going to depend ultimately again on the lapse rate, which is that vertical change in temperature with height, as well as how much moisture is in the warm air that's being lifted. Radiational cooling is another mechanism that we look at in the atmosphere for cooling. At night, the Earth is going to release that long wave radiation. It's going to cool fairly quickly near the Earth's surface as the cooling takes place. The air in contact with that surface is going to be cooled with, with it, and this contact cooling is going to lower the temperature of the air uh, fairly close to the ground, near the surface. And what that results in when we get radiational cooling is we get what's known as a surface or temperature inversion where we have cooler air near the ground and a warmer air um, higher up above that cooler layer. Now if the air is cooled to its dew point, if that temperature lowers to its dew point, you typically get fog and or low stratus clouds to form when we're talking about radiational cooling. So clouds formed in this manner dissipate during the day because of surface heating when there's a lot of mixing in the atmosphere. As soon as you get the surface heating going, um, you generally mix the atmosphere more efficiently. You tend to mix the air masses and the temperature and dew point difference becomes larger as the heating occurs. All right, so as far as clouds go, 
Clouds are classified according to three main principles in the today's training. We're going to talk about atages, the genera, as well as cloud species. Classification is based on the process that produces the clouds. Uh, for, so first let's jump into atages, a little discussion on atages and what that means. So clouds are generally going to occur over a range of altitudes varying from sea level up to about 60,000 feet in the tropics, 45,000 feet in the middle latitudes, and then 25,000 feet in the polar regions. Uh, the three etages include the high, the middle, and the low. And so you may ask yourself, why are the clouds, why, why do they expand much higher up in the tropics, let's say, as compared to the polar areas? Uh, that has to do with the atmosphere as a whole. Closer to the equator, uh, you have a much thicker um, atmosphere as compared to over the poles where you have much colder and denser air. So very warm and less dense air at the tropics due to intense surface heating year-round. That could cause the clouds to be much higher in the atmosphere as compared to the polar areas. All right, so there's, we talk about the high atage. We talk about three main cloud types, cirrus, cirrocumulus, and cirrostratus clouds. Those are in the high atage. We have altocumulus and altostratus clouds are found in the middle atage. And nimbostratus is initially found in the middle atage. So with nimbostratus, it kind of starts at the middle. And then when precipitation comes out from that cloud, the saturation causes that cloud to lower much closer to the surface into the lower atage. There's also cumulus, the cumulonimbus, stratus, and stratocumulus. Those are all in the low atage, but I should let you know that cumulus and cumulonimbus, they can extend across all atages. They can go all the way up from the low to the high atage, depending on their vertical growth that day and the stability of the atmosphere. All right, so for cloud atages, again, just briefly covering the high, middle, and low here on this slide, the high atage is going to extend generally from 10,000 to 25,000 feet in polar regions. It's going to be lower. The atmosphere is much more compact in the polar areas. It's going to extend the high atage from 16,500 to 45,000 feet in the temperate or mid-latitude regions. And then high atage extends from 20 to 60,000 feet in the tropical regions where the atmosphere is much thicker. Um, your heights are much high, you know, your atmospheric heights are, are much larger in magnitude. The middle atage extends from about 6,500 to 13,000 feet in polar regions, 6,500 to 23,000 feet in temperate regions, and then 6,500 feet up to 25,000 feet in the tropical regions. And then the low atage is the last one, extending from near the Earth's surface up to about 6,500 feet. And it doesn't matter. This is one of those cases with the low atage where it doesn't matter if you're in the tropics, the temperate or mid-latitude regions, or the polar areas. All right, so let's break down some of these interesting clouds. I do have some pictures to show as we go through the presentation. We're going to start off in this discussion with the cloud genera, and now we're going to talk about start off with cirrus clouds. Cirrus clouds are detached clouds of delicate and fibrous appearance, are generally white without shading. They appear in various forms, such as you may see them as tufts in the sky, lines drawn across the sky as if an artist was doing a sketch, branching feather-like plumes, and curved lines ending in tufts. These clouds are composed entirely of ice crystals and have a transparent character, depending on the degree of separation of the crystals. Um, so generally with cirrus, you're going to see the sun um, still shining through readily through the cirrus clouds. Before sunrise and sun, after sunset, these clouds, the cirrus clouds, give us some magnificent colors in the sky. Uh, a lot of yellows, bright yellows, and a lot of reds, sometimes some oranges, which are just really, really uh, amazing to see. Uh, being very high in the sky, cirrus clouds light up. They light up before lower clouds and fade out much later due to, at sunrise and sunset, um, the sun's light projecting up from the horizon. Cirrus clouds often indicate the direction in which a storm lies, by the way. 
Here's some examples of cirrus clouds. You can notice the picture in the upper left, how we have that wispy, feathery look. If you've ever seen those on a, let's say, on a um, summer day or a winter day, these are very feathery and they look just amazing. And then in the lower right, you'll notice the pink hue. You see the pink hue to the skies and the purple shading. That is caused by the sun's light. Um, this was a sunset picture, the, the sun as it descends uh, below the horizon, illuminating these clouds because they're so high up in the sky. Now we turn our attention to what's known as cirrocumulus clouds. Cirrocumulus clouds are commonly called the mackerel sky as they look like rippled sand or like cirrus containing globular masses of cotton. They're usually without shadows. Cirrocumulus is an indication that a storm is probably approaching. There's a lot of moisture in the upper levels of the atmosphere. And the bottom right picture there shows an example of what cirrocumulus look like. This is one of my favorite clouds. I've taken many pictures of these clouds and you can actually see them on the spot on weather Weebly website under the weather photo gallery. I've got quite a few of these. Um, I really like to, it's one of my favorite clouds. I really like to get pictures of those. Cirrostratus clouds. These are clouds that form a thin whitish veil, which does not blur the outline of the sun or moon, but it does give rise to something known as a halo, atmospheric halo. The appearance of cirrostratus clouds is a good indication of precipitation. And here's the famous weather proverb that you may have seen before. A ring around the sun or moon means rain or snow is coming soon. In the bottom right hand diagram, you'll notice how the cirrostratus clouds, they're not thick enough to block out the sun, uh, but the refraction of light as, as that refraction occurs off these ice crystals from the sun or the moon, that results in these large rings around the sun or moon, these halos. And so halos, when you start off with a cirrus cloud and then it lowers down to a cirrostratus, there's a good chance that precipitation will occur in your area within the next 12 to 24 hours as those clouds continually lower. Um, and the halo is one of those indicators that you could have precipitation on the way. Moving on to the middle level clouds here for the cloud genera. We'll start off with alto cumulus. Now these clouds appear as a layer or patches of clouds composed of flattened globular masses. The smallest elements of the regularly arranged layer being fairly small and thin with or without shading. I'll show you an example of a picture of alto cumulus. We see these a lot across the mid-Atlantic and southeast Virginia. Um, pretty much year round I've observed these type of clouds. The balls or patches usually are arranged in groups, lines, or waves, and they have larger cloud forms compared to cirrocumulus cumulus and cast shadows. So these are thick enough to cast shadows from the sun, and um, some people get mixed up between cirrocumulus cumulus versus alto cumulus. What type of cloud is it? It all has to do with the size of those um, globular masses. Uh, alto cumulus are going to be larger as compared to the cirrocumulus. cumulus. A corona and irisation are frequently observed with alto cumulus, some of those atmospheric optics. Here's a look at um, an area of alto cumulus clouds. Now they can form generally in rows like this, or they can be in these globular masses where you have these blue patches in between the cloud itself. But this, these clouds are really, this is a really nice shot um, showing alto cumulus in lined up as parallel rows to each other. And this is quite frequently in the mid, frequently seen in the mid latitudes. Moving on to the next cloud genera, altostratus clouds. Now altostratus, they look like thick cirrostratus, but they do not allow for the halo phenomenon. So if you see like a, a, a sheet-like cloud, it's fairly high off the ground. Um, you see the sun or moon faintly shining through them, like the ground glass effect, but there's no halo that is a good, it's a good uh, indicator to you that we're looking at alto stratus clouds and not cirro stratus. So alto stratus, they form a fibrous veil or sheet. They're gray or sometimes they look bluish in color. And sometimes the sun or moon is completely obscured through these. Um, so you will not get a shadow with these. You know, cirro stratus, the sun is going to make it, its light's going to make it through that cloud deck, a cirro stratus cloud deck. 
But altostratus, they're thicker, um, they're lower, and they usually obscure the sun or moon. There's an example of an altostratus cloud in the lower right-hand image. And again, you can see the sun faintly, the outline of the sun faintly uh, through that altostratus cloud deck. Moving on to nimbostratus clouds. Now, nimbostratus, this, you can blame these clouds for those rainy days where you have continuous precipitation throughout the day. They appear as low, amorphous, and rainy layer of clouds. They're usually a dark gray color, um, usually really thick. They're very effective in blocking the incoming solar radiation out. They're usually nearly uniform in appearance, very dull gray, like I said, feebly illuminated, so not very bright type of cloud here. They do produce continuous rain or snow, and they typically evolve initially from an altostratus layer, uh, but those altostratus layers over time grow thicker, and the base becomes lower, transitioning from altostratus to a nimbostratus. Again, the, the interesting thing about nimbostratus clouds is they start out in the middle atage, but as precipitation occurs below their cloud base, uh, additional saturation happens, and these cloud bases continually lower from nimbostratus, so those nimbostratus drop down to the lower atage. If you look at the picture in the bottom right, you'll notice that gray, dull appearance. These clouds tend to produce, these clouds of stratus clouds tend to produce those gloomy days of wintertime, where there's just, it doesn't really get light out very much, or if they're very effective, again, at um, reflecting the incoming solar radiation. Um, so, yeah, this is a very dull, dark gray cloud that produces precipitation. Moving on to stratocumulus clouds, these appear as layer as a layer or patches of clouds. They're composed of these globular masses or rolls. The smallest of the regularly arranged elements is fairly large, and they are soft and gray with darker spots. So look at the, the, the basically these rows of stratocumulus clouds in the bottom right hand. Uh, picture here, just showing you an example of what they would look like. They generally generally have like a darker gray appearance, and sometimes when you look at the sky and see these, uh, it can sometimes give you a menacing look to the sky as if it's going to rain, or some type of precipitation is going to fall out of the cloud. When in many cases with stratocumulus, they don't really produce very much in the way of precipitation at all. Um, but in general, stratocumulus, you know, the elements are much larger, uh, they tend to extend much longer in size as compared, let's say, to alto cumulus. Uh, but again, more of a dull gray underside there in the bottom right-hand picture. Stratus clouds, uh, now these appear as a low uniform layer of clouds resembling fog. Now, if, if you do see fog and it's on the ground, you know, fog at your level, that is a stratus cloud. That is a type of stratus cloud, by the way. A fog is. But in general, these are low clouds, and these result in definitely those gloomier days. Uh, again, not much sun is allowed, sunlight is allowed to pass through these clouds. They usually form in a more solid overcast layer in many cases. Uh, when a layer of stratus is broken up into irregular shreds, it could be something known as stratus fractus, fractus being broken. Um, so and I'll, I'll get to that here. I think I've got a slide on fractus coming up. So in general, stratus clouds, uh, they give the sky a characteristically hazy appearance. A drizzle is going to be the only precip associated with stratus. Uh, when you have this kind of stability, stratus form in a stable atmosphere, when you have that kind of stability, you just don't get much vertical air motion in the atmosphere. And so you get this more of a layer-like stratus cloud. Without those strong vertical air currents, you're just going to get drizzled to fall out of these clouds. Again, many people will see these clouds as well and think uh, they're going to get rained on pretty good, but in general, they only produce drizzle. All right, now let's move into the summertime type of clouds. Now, um, observing the sky for many years, uh, especially in the middle latitudes here in the United States, Cumulus clouds are very common in summertime. They are the cloud of summer, really. Uh, they're a dense cloud with vertical development. The upper surfaces are dome-shaped and exhibit rounded protuberances. Their bases are generally relatively flat. Cumulus fractus 
or fractal cumulus resemble ragged cumulus, those broken apart cumulus that sometimes show constant change beneath a thunderstorm or the low levels of a thunderstorm. The bottom right shows an example of cumulus clouds over an open field. And you'll notice again a flat base, but more of a puffier looking top or a dome at the top. These clouds are created during the summertime, especially due to the fact that we have more intense solar radiation. And as the intense uh, rays of the sun hit the earth, they heat the land surface and the air is heated, it's less dense, it wants to rise, it rises up in the vertical, cools, expands and condenses, forming cumulus clouds. Now, the cumulonimbus cloud. Now this is the cloud that gives you all the action, all right? If you really are a weather fan and you want to see active weather, this is the cloud you want to look for. It's known as a cumulonimbus cloud, also known as a thunderstorm cloud. So cumulonimbus are heavy masses of cumulus type clouds, great vertical extent. Summit will resemble mountains. If you're ever driving down a road and you see these huge puffy clouds rising at great heights, uh, on, the, on the horizon it may appear uh, as, it look, as if it looks like a mountain or tower. These tops of these cumulonimbus are some of the most significant convection, can rise above 60,000 feet. And this happens quite frequently, you know, even up to 70,000 feet, where thunderstorms develop. These cumulonimbus clouds rise all the way up to those heights um, in the southern plains especially. Now the upper part of a cumulonimbus cloud, since it extends from the low atoch all the way up to the high atoch, there's a great variation in temperature through the cloud from the base to the top. The upper part is going to be very cold and below freezing and that's why the upper part of these cumulonimbus clouds is composed of ice crystals and generally has a fibrous texture often spreading out in the shape of an anvil. You may have seen an anvil shape at the top of one of these cumulonimbus clouds in the past. The familiar thunder clouds and precip, it's going to be of a violent, when I say intermittent, that means it starts really fast, ends really quick. You know, next minute you look out the window, it's pouring. A couple minutes later, it's doing nothing. Very showery nature. Uh, quick starts and sudden stops is what's normal. The precip that falls from the cumulonimbus clouds, these thunder clouds. And you also can get hail often that falls from these well-developed cumulonimbus clouds. And they can occasionally display these supplementary features, such as mamma, or these hanging pouch-like protuberances on the underside of the cloud, these mammatus clouds. Tuba, sometimes you get a tuba, which is commonly called a funnel cloud, which extends from their base. And then also you can get what's known as virga, which are wisps or streaks of water or ice particles that fall out of the base of this cumulonimbus cloud, but they evaporate, that moisture evaporates before reaching the Earth's surface as precipitation. Here are some great examples, upper left, showing a cumulonimbus cloud. And remember, in this previous slide here, I talked about fibrous texture at the top, often spreading out the shape of an anvil, a hammer anvil. Look at the upper left-hand portion of this cloud and how it spreads out horizontally, resembling that anvil shape. Um, the lower right-hand image is a really cool picture of mamma or mammatus clouds, which are these pouch-like protuberances underneath the base of a cumulonimbus cloud. So if you see these mamma clouds or mammatus clouds, you, you know right away that you're looking at a cumulonimbus cloud. Okay, You can identify that's below the base of the cumulonimbus cloud. So this is really cool stuff. Um, there's been some really neat pictures I've seen on social media showing many forms of mammatus clouds. They look like egg crates. Uh, they look like these udders of the cow. Um, so they're really cool. Right, now we move into a topic on cloud species. Um, one of these examples of species is known as Castellanus. Now these clouds, uh, which present in at least some portion of the upper part, they, they are cumuliform protuberances in the form of, of castle turrets. Uh, they look like castle turrets. So these turrets are generally taller than they are wide and are connected to a common base. And this applies, the Castellanus cloud species applies mainly to cirrocumulus, altocumulus, and stratocumulus. Um, altocumulus, Castellanus, indicates a very unstable atmosphere, by the way. So when you see these little mini turrets that resemble these castle turrets, 
Um, it's unstable atmosphere, really. Um, the bottom image here shows some cumulus becoming, um, having those turrets and the small little vertical pockets of rising air motion creating them. Another form of cloud species is known as stratiformis. Clouds which spread out in an extensive horizontal sheet or layer. This term applies to alto cumulus, strato cumulus, and occasionally cirro cumulus. You might get these, these waves or these ripples in the cloud formation. And the example here on the picture, I'm showing you an example of the cirro cumulus stratiformis. See how they are more layer-like and more wavy and ripply. Another really interesting cloud species is lenticularis. Now, these have mistakenly been identified as UFOs, believe it or not, by many people when they see it in the sky. It has a UFO shape. It has more of an, an almond or lens shape. And they're often elongated and having well-defined outlines. And these primarily occur um, in the vicinity of mountainous terrain or topographical changes where higher topography. The term applies to alto cumulus clouds, strato cumulus as well as cirro cumulus. One of the more common forms of lenticularis has to do with the alto cumulus standing lenticular. And this is a very turbulent area. This is, this is a type of cloud, if, if you're a pilot, you definitely don't want to go near because this is associated with extreme atmospheric turbulence. And then there is another cloud species that's known as humilis. Now these um, this refers to cumulus clouds of only a slight vertical extent, and they generally appear in a flattened shape. Uh, look at the bottom right-hand picture here of cumulus humilis, and you notice how flat these clouds are. There's just not much vertical development to this. Okay, um, So this a cumulus humilis cloud will be associated with a fair weather day, uh, one in which you have high pressure in control. Um, overall, you have uh, an inversion where temperatures are increasing with height. They're, they're, warmer temps above a, um, a cooler surface, perhaps, um, but general stable conditions. And then cumulus congestus. Now, this congestus species, cumulus, are remarkably sprouting and are often a great vertical extent. You'll see this bulging upper part of a congestus cloud. It frequently resembles a cauliflower. So now I want you to take a look at humulus, very flat, cumulus humulus versus cumulus congestus much different atmosphere. This is a stable atmosphere and this is an unstable atmosphere. And then wrapping up today's training on clouds, I wanted to show you the complete picture. Um, you know, the cloud family from the surface where you would see the stratus clouds. Maybe you have some fog on the ground there. The fog is a stratus cloud on the ground. Um, and then you continually go up in height. Uh, the lower levels, you may have a cumulus and stratocumulus clouds. Um, Nimbus stratus can extend below 6,500 feet, and, and especially during precipitation, as we talked about. And then continually moving upward in the atmosphere, we have alto cumulus and alto stratus at the mid-levels of the atmosphere. Cumulonimbus rising to towering heights, extending from the lower atoj all the way up to the higher atoj. And then the high clouds, cirrocumulus, cirrostratus, and cirrus. Those cirrus are made up completely of ice crystals because temperatures are very cold at levels in the atmosphere where they form. All right, that wraps things up today on the training on clouds. I hope you got something great out of today's training and learned something, um, whether we're talking about species of clouds, uh, whether we're talking about genera of clouds, the various types of clouds, what they look like, different images I've shared today with you um, in general. So I, I just want to end by saying clouds are very, very, very important as far as determining what the weather is going to do in the future. Um, you can wake up in the morning and you can get, you yourself can be an excellent forecaster of the weather in your particular area by just observing the sky and looking up at the sky, enjoying the sky, um, you know, figuring out if the atmosphere is stable or unstable for the day. Um, for example, a um, stratus type cloud, a more layer like cloud, that's going to indicate the atmosphere is stable today. So with a stratus type cloud, you're most likely not going to get much in the way of precipitation outside of maybe drizzle. If you get a towering cumulus cloud or a cumulonimbus cloud, you see these huge puffy clouds growing in height, there's a good chance you're going to get some heavy showers, or at least somewhere close by will get heavy showers for the day. If you combine the effects of the clouds, what type of clouds are in the sky? If you then correlate that with the wind direction as well as 
um, the barometric pressure tendency. Is the, is the barometric pressure rising or falling? Um, what type of clouds do we have? And again, where is the wind coming from? What direction? A northwest wind in the northern hemisphere is usually associated with uh, fair weather and, and, and dry and stable conditions. A southeast to southwest wind is generally associated with more unstable atmospheric conditions. Uh, in, in that case, you're most likely to see more of the cumulus clouds and some heavier showers um, throughout the day. So there's a lot of interesting things, a lot of ways we can apply clouds to developing forecasts each and every day. And again, we have tons of cloud pictures on the Spot on Weather Weebly site. You definitely need to go check it out. Um, you go to search Google search Spot on Weather Weebly. Um, you're going to find really cool cloud pictures in our weather photo gallery. Um, I'm always interested in taking more and more pictures. And then just one more thing to note about clouds. It's really, really cool is there's generally a sequence of clouds which, tell you, which tells you what the weather is going to be like later in the day. Um, I talked a little bit about this when we did the weather training on fronts, where with warm fronts you get a general predictable sequence of clouds, right? The cirrus clouds, you'll see those first. They're, they're higher up in the atmosphere, um, made of ice crystals, and as you get closer, let's say, to a warm front, those cirrus clouds will, will lower to cirrostratus clouds. You might see that halo. You might see that halo around the sun or moon here. And then those clouds will lower to altostratus, a mid-level layer cloud, then down to stratus, maybe nimbostratus, closer to the surface front. But just watch the progression of the clouds throughout the sky as a cyclone is moving through your area or as a front moves through your area. And, and, and the forms and the way the clouds, the way they are in the sky, it changes throughout the year. It's never the same. Um, so, for example, I can look up today and look at a, a sky in August, and I see a lot of puffy cumulus clouds. That's a normal indicator that we have more buoyant, heated air rising, a lot of convective currents, air currents going on. Whereas in the wintertime, in the middle latitudes, I may not see that cumulus cloud very often, unless things get really unstable. So the sky does change throughout the course of the year, throughout the different seasons as well. But I encourage you to continue to look at the sky, to learn about our natural world. It's really a fascinating place. The weather operates in cycles that are very repetitive. So whatever you do, you know, at your location, whether you keep a, a weather diary or some kind of log, it's really cool stuff to observe the weather change before your eyes. And the sky is our visual indicator of what's to come. All right, that wraps things up. It's spot on weather. We certainly enjoy giving you this training, uh, sharing the passion of weather with each and every one of you. Um, continue to follow us on our forecast on the Facebook Spot on Weather page, as well as Twitter, um, the website, Spot on Weather Weebly. Thank you so much for subscribing to this channel. Um, we'll be doing a few more training topics as we um, get through the month of August. And then um, we're looking at resuming more of the forecasting flavor as we get into the fall including the up-and-coming winter weather forecast, which is a lot of interesting factors that may tie in with this upcoming winter. You don't want to miss them. All right, this is Spot on Weather. If we're not spot on, we're not doing the right. I'm meteorologist Matthew Euler. Take care and God bless everybody. Have a great day.